Welcome to the Nixon Seminar. I'm Hugh Hewitt, President of the Nixon Foundation. We're pleased to welcome tonight three new members of the seminar, Dr. Monica Crowley, Dr. Nadia Shadlow, and Congressman Michael Waltz. They're joining our 12 other members and our co-chairman, former Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, Ambassador O'Brien and Secretary Pompeo are joined by a special guest tonight, uh, entrepreneur and author Peter Thiel. And I turn it over to you, Mr. Secretary. Great, Hugh. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be with everyone this evening. We'll look forward to a wide open discussion on a range of things that impact uh, high tech, America, uh, national security. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about China and the Chinese Communist Party, I am sure. Peter, I thought I'd start off tonight with just a general question. You spent a lot of time, I've read most of what you've written, you spent a lot of time thinking and writing about the technology fight between the West and the ideas that the Chinese Communist Party puts forward, whether that's disinformation or the capacity to move digits around the world. And they now have a full-on digital currency uh, that they are deploying. Give us, give us all your sense of uh, where, where we sit today, if we were to draw up the uh, assets and liabilities for the West and for the Chinese Communist Party, how would you evaluate the relative positions across various technology spaces? Well, it's a pretty, pretty broad question. I think, um, you know, I think that in many, in many ways, um, we, are, we are, in most areas, we are still ahead of China, or, uh, and uh, we are still far more innovative. I think innovation happens in the West, and uh, shockingly little innovation happens in uh, in, um, in 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 China, um, but um, but they are they have been very good at uh, copying things, stealing things, um, and uh, and to some extent, uh, if China is able to just catch up, there is a way in which it will become a more powerful country. You know, China has four times the population of the U.S., and so if if you converge and China gets to uh, to parity on productivity on technology, you'll have you know four times the GDP, and maybe four times the military, and it will it will be the dominant power. So uh, so so parity means the West is losing. Means the U.S. is losing at parity. Of, of the of the technology, if you took uh, AI or machine learning or the or blockchain, how much of that did they create? How much of that have they stolen from the West? Uh, do you have a sense for those? Well, I think. Um, Again, those aren't the only two possibilities. I think uh, I don't think they created very much. Uh, I think a lot of it was just handed over from from the West, so it was not even stolen. Uh, you know, I I criticized Google a few years ago for uh, refusing to work on its AI technology mm -hmm. on Project Maven with the U.S. military, but working with you know Chinese uh, universities and Chinese researchers, and since everything in China is sort of a civilian military fusion, Google was effectively working with the Chinese military, not with the American military. And you know, there's sort of this question. Why was Google doing this? And uh, and one of the things that uh, that I that I sort of was told by some of the insiders at Google was they figured, you know, they might as well give the technology out through the front door because if they didn't give it, it, it would get stolen anyway. So um, yeah. so so it doesn't quite count as theft, but it's quasi theft. Co Co-opted, yes. Robert, thanks, Mr. Secretary. Uh, so so one of the things that we've seen uh, and it's happened faster than I think the experts uh, anticipated, especially over the past decade, is that the the Chinese military and the, the naval services have closed the gap on the U.S., uh, both in terms of quantity, uh, mm -hmm. but in also quality, uh, much faster than, than expected. So the gap, I, I agree with you, I think we still have an edge, but the gap is getting smaller. Uh, they've done things, so they're, they're looking at their military platforms uh, the way maybe Silicon Valley or industry would, would mm -hmm. look at a product. So there's iterative uh, manufacturing and design, right. beta testing, uh, constantly upgrading. Uh, and we're looking at what the Pentagon does where we have these, you know, pristine processes that take, you know, decades to get to a, a, a platform that's perfect or near perfect, uh, but it's taken us forever to, to to get the products designed and then eventually deployed and at, at a very high expense. Uh, what does the Pentagon need to do to 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 keep the the edge and also to fix procurement, uh, uh, you know, in, in some ways to make sure that the Chinese don't catch up the way they appear to be doing, you know, relatively quickly. Yes. Well, I think. Um you know, this, the procurement question is obviously a very broad question, but uh, but I think what was healthy about the um, the military um, you know industry complex in the US, what was relatively healthy about it during the Cold War was we had some balance of bigger companies and a lot of smaller companies in the ecosystem, and uh, and I think you know big companies are generally good at doing things at scale. Uh, small companies are generally better at innovating and coming out with uh, yeah. with new products, and you want some 
ecosystem that has a blend of both kinds of companies. And I think what happened in 89 after the Cold War ended was there was a, a shrinking of military <coughs> budgets, but there was also an incredible consolidation of, um, of uh, the defense industry. And the consolidation actually meant that the money was spent less efficiently, especially um, with respect to R&D. And so, uh, so we spent less money and less efficiently, and so there was some massive decline in, uh, in, in the effectiveness of the system in the 90s. I think there, um, I think there have been, you know, various attempts over the last, you know, half decade to to um, to reform the procurement process, to figure out ways to um, to fund uh, smaller companies, to um, to do some R to allocate some R and D to all these different projects. I think we've improved some, but uh, it has to be sort of an integrated process. You know, you don't want to just get a five million dollar DARPA ga grant right. where where what, what you invent gets stuck in a broom closet in the Pentagon. It has to somehow. You know, you have to be able to get to a pilot that scales, and it has to be integrated into the whole, into the whole procurement process. And that's, it's you know, there's just all these uh, risk-averse things where you know if you're you're probably if you're um, if you're if you're working the Defense Department, you know, it's always safe to go with IBM or something <laughs> like that, but it, it never works. You know, it, 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 putting these together in some way, uh, in terms of how this uh, technology moves. Uh, in a good year, 2019, there were 360,000 Chinese students studying at American universities. There were less than 30,000 Americans studying at Chinese universities, in-country, in Chinese universities. Make any sense? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're an open society. They're not, they're not open in, in any way. It's, it's just incredibly, you know, I, I, sp I spent uh, some time in China in 2015, 2016, uh, you know, my my uh, book on startups did actually surprisingly well, so I did this two-week, two-week book tour. But it is, um, you know, there's sort of, there's sort of crazy ways if you just drive around Beijing where it's you have all these, you know, military, paramilitary, poli militarized police. They're you know defending themselves against their own population. So even, you know, even within China, things are segmented, closed off in all sorts of ways. And then, uh, and then even though there are you know, some number of Westerners in there, you know, it's also as a ratio, so you know, thirty thousand. In a population of 1.4 billion, which yeah. is 360,000, a population of you know 330 million. So yeah. it's not 10 to one; it's actually yeah. maybe 40 to one, real adjusted for population. Yeah, that's the question, kind of as a policy matter. So you think about capital de deploying capital. You think about where to invest in the best ideas, the most innovative technologies. Uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of students who are coming here who are either going to go back or mm -hmm. stay and work here, become part of the wor U.S. workforce for often uh, large U.S. companies, but sometimes small U.S. companies. And the question. Uh, is well taken. We are, in fact, an open country. I think that makes it riskier to have those students studying here because the capacity for that information to end up in places that benefits the uh, Chinese Communist Party's model, its ideology, is pretty significant. And just as you stare at workforce issues here in the United States, and there was a president trying to figure out what mm -hmm. the right policy was, do you have any thoughts for how they should begin to think about that? Um. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're basically right that you want to be in the more restrictive zone. It's, it's quite hard to do anything given um, where a lot of the university leadership is sort of in a completely deranged space on this, where they think of um, graduate students as sort of indentured servants, right. cheap, <laughs> underpaid labor, and, uh, it, and uh, maybe the, the Chinese grad students are actually yeah. less demanding and are willing to get paid less or something. And there's, there are all sorts of weird ways that... Uh, the universities have not been very helpful, and I think uh, we should just be putting a lot of pressure on them. You should be looking at, you know, are they getting money from Chinese funding? I think you know so, some of the, and there's probably been a lot of abuse on this in, in various ways. And uh, now, uh, Peter, following up on Mike's uh, question, which I I think there's a consensus now that AI and quantum computing are the new high grounds, or at least mm -hmm. will be the high grounds for the future. And and I, and I think there's still a consensus that we have an edge uh, in both those areas. Yes. Although again, it's. Uh, it's a diminished edge over where it was a few years back. Uh, what's your advice to the Biden administration? How do we stay ahead on quantum and AI? Uh, you know, keeping in mind that we're an open society and we've got all these graduate students here and that sort of thing. Uh, what What do we need to do to uh, to stay in the forefront? Because my, my concern is if we fall behind, we lose the high ground. Uh, we're going to be in for a rough spell. Yeah, the thing that I would say is tricky about AI is that there are you know a lot of aspects of the technology that I think we don't actually want to be pursuing too much because. Um, it's it's AI is what you need for a surveillance society. You know, I've, I've I've had this riff where you know people often say crypto or Bitcoin is a vaguely libertarian technology. I mean, technology is 
politically neutral, but it can still be <laughs> crypto sort of, if crypto is kind of libertarian, then AI is kind of communist. And, uh, and so even though we're ahead from the you know, basic science of AI, China is willing to apply it. It's willing to turn the entire society into you know, a face recognition surveillance state that's uh, you know, far more intrusive, far more totalitarian than even you know, Stalinist Russia was. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's something we're not willing to do. So, yeah, let, let so it's, it's a very two-edged yeah, thing no, in that let, way. And let me follow up on that question, Mike, if, it's, uh, if I can yeah, of course. Uh, jump in. Uh, so, so what do these folks do? I mean, we've, we've got authoritarian countries now. The PRC is the, the, you know, the lead example, but you've got others, Russia, that are going to be able to employ these high-tech tools to create this total surveillance society, uh, so, you know, something beyond even Orwell. When you mm -hmm. go back and read 1984, it seems a little quaint right now. Uh, how do the, how are those people going to defeat uh, the high tech tools that, that are oppressing them or that are, that are surveilling them, uh, and, and how do they ever win back their freedom or their liberty uh, if a, a government's willing, a regime's willing to use those tools uh, the way we've seen the PRC and others uh, employ them? What are your thoughts on that? I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, cer certainly, um, in the 1980s, I had I had the view that the Soviet Union could never be reformed from within, and that even the the Eastern Law countries would never, you know, that it was high tech enough that the, you know, you had the, you had the you know, secret police with guns and they could break up any nascent protest and it would, it would never, never change. So there's certainly, you know, the history of the late '80s suggests there's more possibility than, than we think, and uh, it's always, you know, there probably are, are ways in which, you know, the Chinese government's um, certainly not acting like the technologies are. That straightforward. You know, they're reinforced with you know concentration camps and lots of police and lots of secret police. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's it, it, it's not obvious how you how you how you change that at all. Um, and and this is you know, and it is you know it, it's 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 not developing at all in the way that people you know the people people thought it was it was going to. You know, one of the and I think I think this is I, I'm interested in getting your, your guys' view on this. But you know, one thought I always have is. Why did it take us, you know, so long to wake up to, to the threat of China, to the way it was not becoming a liberal democracy, and why were we able to tell ourselves all these fictional stories in the West for, for so long? And the, you know, the the, the, the crazy thought experiment I have on it was that, you know, it was, if Tiananmen had happened one year later, we might have woken up 27 years earlier. So when Tiananmen happened in June of 1989, right, you had then, Brent Scowcroft right. from the Bush 41 administration went to China and said, you know. Don't worry about it because you're anti-Soviet, and that's what matters. Right, and then Had it happened two years later, yeah. or one, even one or, year later. Yeah, yeah. It might, we, we might have come to our senses, you know, 27 years earlier, or something like that. Yeah. Look, I, I think that's right. I think there's a lot of uh, theories out there. In the end, it was easy. <laughs> we, we we believe we destroyed the Soviet Union. We were right. right about that, and so who needs another? Who needs another long twilight struggle? Right? Who needs to go fight that? And so for a long time, and, and deep commercial interests became connected to. Continuing this that's as of course well. that's of course very different from the uh, that's very different very from the different. Soviet uh, Cold War conflict where there was you yeah. know, very little economic overlap. Yeah. Uh, I mean, think of everyone who thought you know if I could sell you know one hamburger to every every Chinese person you know I could sell a billion hamburgers a year. I mean that's kind of the you know fill in the blank with the right. the, the product. But uh, it, it was such an allure. Uh, you know the market was so attractive. I think to to American business folks that that, that those commercial interest caused people to tell themselves a story that just the cheap through. supply chains for yeah. Walmart yeah. or Apple absolutely yeah. I had a, just one more question uh, but a, a comment to your point about we didn't know I remember I was a young soldier uh, patrolling the East German border mm -hmm. in 1989 and literally left two weeks before the, the wall came down we had no earthly idea mm -hmm. it was coming down two weeks <clears> on I, I watch the Chinese I watch how they respond when we talk about the Chinese Communist Party as separate from the country of China itself it's fragile whether it's Tibet or Mongolia or or Taiwan or Hong Kong, it, it, they know, and that's why the surveillance state has to be so strong. How, how good of a model do you think we currently have at all of what's going on in China? You know, is Xi, is Xi like in absolute control? Are there lots of factions that might overthrow him any day? You know, is, is, I think with all these things, I think we have a pretty good understanding, but there's no, I, I always, hmm. I think of this in the Middle East, we think we know what's going on, and the reality is it's so much more complex, so much hmm. more, uh, so much more uh, tribal, so much, so much more intricate than we can ever fully appreciate from the outside. As hard as we work on it, I think we often miss things. That's why we didn't see the fall of the Soviet Union coming. It's why uh, you see these moments where the intelligence community in the U.S. and the West just can't get it right. Although Xi seems to have, have is, 
he seems to have a, a very serious grasp on power. And, and the early mm -hmm. corruption purges were, were clearly a cover for getting rid of political rivals. And uh, uh, he seems pretty unrivaled right now. I mean, yes. it, 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 that, that may not be the case, but that's, yeah. that's all, all appearances are that he's got a, a stranglehold on power. And in, we should take China. him at his word for his intentions. Yeah. I thought I'd get one that, that comes to technology. It's a narrower question than where I began. So uh, our team spent a lot of time thinking about semiconductors and the ecosystem around mm -hmm. it and the manufacture of semiconductors. I went back this week, you'd, you'd sent a note out, and I went back and uh, reread then uh, Nixon Kennedy debates where they were debating these mm -hmm. two little islands off the coast of China mm -hmm. that are part of Taiwan formerly in deep, intricate debates. Taiwan is even more central mm -hmm. today to the uh, high-tech infrastructure for the world, TSMC itself. Yes. And all of the uh, all, all of the subsidiary technologies around yes. it. I wonder what your sense is. So we have a policy. It's our uh, one China policy, and the communiques that flow from it. The Trump administration largely stayed with that. G give me your sense of what would happen if that were upended, not necessarily through military force, like right? We didn't steal it. If it's coerced into those semiconductors not being available for, and that the hand semiconductors not being as readily available to the West. What's your sense, and how should we? How should the private sector think about that as well? Well, um, you know, I, th I think there are basically two um, cutting-edge semiconductor manufacturers. It's uh, Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung. And uh, there were probably something like 30 semiconductor companies that were cutting-edge uh, 20 years ago right. uh, or 30 years ago. And so it's, uh, it's gotten a lot more expensive, so these scale economies. And, um, and, um, and so and then you have these questions about, you know, how many semiconductors do you need that are really cutting edge versus how many can be these, you know, um, more cheap mass produced uh, things. But, uh, but yeah, probably, um, yeah, probably, you know, if, if you need a, if you're going to have a self-driving car, that probably will require <laughs> a, uh, a cutting edge semiconductor. And uh, that's where, you know, th th there's probably some weird way in which from an economic point of view, um, you can almost think of Taiwan as just, it's just this one company. It's, um, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor. And then you know the the political questions are you know who really controls the company, is it, you know is is it does the Chinese Communist Party have hooks into it, um, or you know are they still more scared of them? But uh, but somehow the the board corporate politics of Taiwan Semiconductor are probably, in some ways, a proxy for all of Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it would be very and then and I think Samsung is is, is 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 probably the other one in the mix. You know one of the one of the very strange um, dynamics in Silicon Valley is people don't do very much with semiconductors anymore. Right. You know, I'm, I'm a venture capitalist. Uh, I get pitched on semiconductor startups every few years, but then it's always, I haven't done that much with it. I don't really know what's going on. It seems very expensive, very complicated. And uh, I think one of the weird uh, problems with, you know, 20 years of intellectual property theft or where IP doesn't really have that much, as much value as it used to, is that you learn not to invest in things like that. Yeah. And you can think of consumer internet, which has been, the be-all and end-all for tech investing in the U.S. for the last quarter century as um, the kind of thing you invest in in a world where there are no intellectual property rights. Because uh, <laughs> consumer internet, it's, it's, there are these companies, they're brands, they network effects, um, and you get to scale. And then if, even if people copy you, they can never take it over, whereas semiconductors are in a very different yeah. different zone. That's I think we're still, I think, yeah. you know, I think we're still, we're still ahead of it in a lot of ways on the design side. Um, and so it is one of the places where, you know, I think we can do more to block China than they can do to block us. Yeah. But, uh, but we've yeah. lost a lot of ground in the last 20 yeah. years. That's well, I, I think we did that at the end of the Trump administration. Uh, I worked with Commerce and State and, and, and really, uh, I, in fact, when I, when I first took office as National Security Advisor, everyone said the Huawei fight's over, we've lost. Uh, we decided, Mike and, uh, and Wilbur and uh, Larry Kudlow and I got together and decided well, we haven't lost. And, and we were using the design tools and uh, and some other things. We were able to, to put a crimp on Huawei, and and now I think 29 of 30 uh, Western democracies in Europe, plus Japan, Australia, India, others have moved away from Huawei and want trusted providers. And uh, so, does and, that, and so, so it, does so that it showed that we had some, it did show we had some leverage still. Does that um, so? I, I I would say in general we're, you know, China's at, at best at parity, mostly still behind us. Huawei may be, may be the one exception, at least with all the subsidies they've, they've given the company. Um, what do you think the alternative to Huawei is? Is it Ericsson and Nokia, or is it, uh, which I think of as not great, slightly sclerotic companies, but maybe that's the best we can do? 
or um, or my, my sort of Luddite answer is that uh, maybe we should just say that the 5G technology is overrated and we can be a little bit slower <laughs> in rolling it out, even though you can never say that in public, seemingly. Yeah, so I, I think actually both those answers are correct. I, th I don't think we have to be quite as fast as, as we thought we did, but uh, I look at a company like Rakuten in uh, mm -hmm. Japan, uh, which is not a, you know, a, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we were out, uh, Mike and, and Larry and, and even the president, we were out pushing Ericsson and Nokia and Rakuten, these you know, not American companies would have been nice if we had one, but I think I think Dell is doing some interesting things. I think Microsoft is doing some interesting things. So, uh, and, and I, I think the, the the, the technology with some of these radio towers and radio devices that are small and inexpensive and, and can be swapped in and out like servers uh, are now. Uh, I, I think it has the potential to leapfrog what uh, Huawei is doing. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm pretty bullish on it. Uh, but I think it's, it, it will take a little bit more time. The, the problem is going to be, and you, you hit the nail on the head, Peter, is that in countries in Africa and Latin America where there's zero money, mm -hmm. and whether, e even if the technology that, uh, that the West develops is less expensive, which I think it will be, uh, if the Chinese Communist Party is coming in saying we'll give you a free Huawei 5G right. kit, uh, or we'll, we'll take a loan that you can repay you know, with opaque terms and uh, and put you in a debt trap, but you know you can have the, your 5G today and mm -hmm. you can pay us back, you know, 20 years from now uh, when we take your your railroad stock mm -hmm. and we we take your mines and, yes. and, and and that sort of thing, it is attractive to to take the Huawei if, if someone's offering it to you for free or apparently it's free and. Uh, as we know, there's nothing free, and these countries are going to give up a lot of sovereignty by taking the Huawei equipment. But you know, for for certain countries in in Africa and Asia and Latin America, it's going to be a you know it's going to be hard to say no. It's very appealing. And just on, on one other area of the whole tech tech stacks, we're covering a lot of ground here. Um, where um, uh, Mike, maybe I'll ask you where where and how do you think about the space race that's sort of emerging? You know, with you know to some extent Russia, but even more with with China and. Um, where you know they're sort of launching all these killer satellites and yeah. so maybe space weapons or you know, and a lot of this of course is you know very classified. Yeah, a lot of it's what, classified, and and there's a lot of people that know more about it than I do. But suffice it to say, here here's a data point that's useful. In 2019, the Chinese t launched more missiles than the rest of the world combined. Mm -hmm. Those are tests, right? They just have the resources, the scale <laughs> of what they're doing to work to put up the right satellites to work to make sure they've got the capability. Uh, is staggering, and they are moving very, very quickly. And so I don't want to say much about where we are from a parity perspective, but there will be uh, an enormous amount of energy and resources put into place so that whenever there's a conflagration somewhere in the world, mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a global one, uh, that space will be able to generate an awful lot of leverage and an awful lot of power for some country who gets this most right. And then maybe another question on, you know, the, um, the war gaming, all, where p part of the thing that's very strange is we have, China has these sort of, Newfangled weapons that haven't really been tested out, so they have like hyp, you know, will hypersonic missiles destroy U.S. aircraft carriers, or will they have? Will their satellites be able to knock out our satellites? Or you know, and and, and I'm not exactly sure how well it can be gamed out even by the Chinese side, since a lot of the stuff has never been tried. If you want to take a shot? I'm talk about it. How, yeah, how, how, should one, how should one think about about that? You know, are they going to be deterred because it's so newfangled that they won't quite know that it works? Or will it embolden them into telling some heroic story how they're going <laughs> to win without, you know, taking any casualties at all? Look, it could be both at the same time, right? So, so number one, I remember a, a few years back calling uh, Buzz Aldrin, who we, we had out here at the library not too long ago, uh, to ask him, you know, he was known as Dr. Rendezvous at NASA. I said, how, how easy will it be for one of these DF-21 or these Dongfang missiles to take out an aircraft carrier? And he goes, the problem is the aircraft carrier is moving and the missile, you know, you've got to, you know, it's a pretty tough shot. Uh, on the other hand, if the Chinese build enough of them and saturate, you mm -hmm. know, a zone, uh, it may be tougher, to, you mm -hmm. know, even a fast-moving aircraft carrier to, to avoid a, a missile. Uh, look, the, the way to deter the Chinese, we, you know, the, all of, when you talked about the, the technology theft and the copying, all of the hypersonic uh, mm -hmm. technology that the Chinese have and are now deploying mm -hmm. uh, and their missiles was stolen from us or, 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 mm -hmm. or obtained in, in gray, gray market or open, open source uh, mm -hmm. by open source means. And, and during the Obama administration, when we stopped doing our, our hypersonic uh, uh, research and deployment, uh, the Chinese leapt ahead. Uh, one of the things that, that was, was really a, a triumph of the last administration was, was refunding the, the military. Uh, you know, we've got some, the Chinese have sophisticated weapons, we've got some pretty sophisticated weapons ourselves. Uh, but what we need to do, peace through strength works, and, and we need to get those platforms deployed, not just mm -hmm. do the research on them and, and talk about them, but we've got to get them deployed. So 
Uh, we, we have to put the Chinese at risk right now. They're, they're putting us at risk. We've got to put their, mm-hmm. their airfields, we've got to put their, their ships, we've got to put their launch sites at risk the way they're doing ours with, with their, the weapons that they're deploying quickly. Uh, at the end of the day, I take our qualitative edge yeah. you know, any day over theirs, but, but mm-hmm. we do have to continue to fund the DOD, and we've got to, we've got to make sure that these cutting-edge weapons that, that we've done a great job developing actually get deployed and aren't just, as you talked about earlier, uh, sitting right. in a room closet at the Pentagon, right. but they're maybe, actually out in we'll, the field. Maybe we'll send it. Hugh, have you got some folks out there that would like to provide some questions to Peter? Michael Waltz. Congressman, you have the floor. Hey, thanks, Hugh. Can you hear me okay? We do. Oh, hey, well, great to be with you. Robert, great to see you. Mike, great to see you. Man, we miss you guys in D.C. Oh, my God. <laughs> I used to say Afghanistan was tough, but uh, there, there, there are days these days. Uh, look, uh, Peter, thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, you know, I, I come at this with a business background, but also I'm, I'm sitting now as the ranking Republican on our research and technology uh, committee, also in space and, and, and armed services. And, and you know, we've discussed a lot, obviously, how the IP stuff that is either being IP that's being handed over, the IP that's being stolen through, uh, through cyber and through other means. I'm very interested in your thoughts, putting on your, your venture capital hat on how we block and tackle and fence what's going on in the M&A world. Uh, We're seeing companies, uh, small, medium, and large, whether they're chip manufacturers, CRISPR technology, advanced materials, I mean, down, you know, really down the shopping list that are getting uh, gobbled up through (coughs) M&A services industry is is doing quite well on it. Uh, of course, we have CFIUS, but that is frankly uh, hugely under-resourced and I think really only scratching the tip of the iceberg. DOD, the Defense Department just rolled out a trusted capital uh, mechanism, but that's really a process that and it's a vetting process. What I'm interested in is what from your perspective you think we can do either legislatively or importantly from a technology standpoint, I've, I've attended a number of presentations we're looking at how AI can follow the money, can look at beneficial ownership uh, and help us understand the money flows into the into the venture capital world so that we can protect some of these technologies. You know, again, particularly from, from my vantage point as the head Republican on uh, research and tech uh, subcommittee. Hey, thanks so much, and and I'll I'll mute and hand it over to you, Peter. Yes, well, I think um, I th- I think that uh, th- sort of a lot of nuance to this, but uh, to first approximation, you want to have um, make it harder for um, Chinese investors to invest in the U.S. and perhaps um, we should also make it a little bit harder for American investors to invest in China, because uh, I, I think I think one of the ways that sort of the political game theory, the political economy, what always works is that we have these um, U.S. investors that um, invest in China that become a big constituency for open capital flows, yeah. for doing this. I think sort of there's a decent part of the Wall Street crowd is pretty pretty bad in this r- regard. And so uh, so I would dial it back on both sides. And maybe maybe making it harder for U.S. investors to invest in China is um, is an e- almost equally important uh, part, of, part of this. Hey, uh, Mary Kissel, you are next. We are, funding, we are funding our greatest adversary, both through our capital flows, but then through we're hand, what, we're, what we're handing over. So certainly welcome any, any follow-on ideas you have. Okay, Mary Kissel. Thanks, you, Peter, thanks for joining us, um, Robert and uh, uh, Secretary. It's great to be with you. Um, it just occurs to me that we're we're assuming that uh, maybe the viewing audience knows why we we care so much about this. It might just want to say we, we deal with a lot of authoritarian regimes, but um, there's only one that has the capability to dominate, and that's China. Um, Peter, it, it seems like they're in a tech war with us, but we're not really in a tech war with them yet. Um, and they have certain advantages, particularly on the big data front in that they can uh, command the collection of an enormous amount of data that's fundamental to AI, um, also from countries that they dominate uh, in their near abroad and elsewhere. Um, they, they're also collecting through illicit means. Um, how, do we, how do we compete with that? Is that? Do we need a free world coalition 
uh, on the data front. And, and secondly, you know, and I think this was implied earlier, is there a way to innovate around it? Um, you were talking about 5G, you know, does Starlink kind of make that obsolete? Um, you know, these are difficult questions, but uh, well, maybe, maybe uh, tackle uh, those. Uh, your you. voice got turned off here. Um, well, I think I, I think I got the the first parts of that, that question. Um, you know, I, I I do think that uh, that seeing China in, in an adversarial way um, would be you know a helpful start. And uh, and Silicon Valley has not been that good on this. Although although it's you know it's in some ways it's 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 structurally better than um, than Wall Street or Hollywood or the universities because. Uh, Silicon Valley, for the most part, has been frozen out of China, and uh, and so it's not. Uh, it doesn't naturally believe that it, it can get that much out of it. If you look at the, you know, if you look at the big five tech companies, um, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, virtually very very little presence in China, and so they they aren't naturally you know a pro pro China constituency. Apple is probably the one that's structurally um, a real problem because the the whole iPhone supply chain. Uh, gets made from China, and Apple is the one that has has real synergies with, with mm. China. Um, but then, uh, uh, then there is something about the, uh, you know, the woke politics inside these companies. The way, the way they think of themselves is not really American companies, and uh, and it, it's it's somehow very very difficult to, uh, for them to have a sharp anti-China edge of of any sort, whatsoever. You know. It, uh, um, you know, at, at, at Facebook, I'll, I'll give, give an example. There, uh, you know, you had uh, on the with the Hong Kong protests a year ago. The employees from Hong Kong were all in favor of the protests and, and free speech, <coughs> but there were more employees at Facebook who were born in China than who were born in Hong Kong. And the Chinese nationals actually said that you know um, it was just Western arrogance uh, and you shouldn't be taking right. the Hong Kong side and, and things like that. And um, and then the, the rest of the employees at Facebook, you know, sort of stayed out of it. But uh, the internal debate felt like people were actually more anti-Hong Kong than pro-Hong Kong. Peter, let and me follow up on and that. And that's, that's kind of, you have kind yeah. of these weird social things Peter, inside Peter, these companies. Peter, let me follow Peter up with a question that. on that. Uh, so so in, in Silicon Valley, we've got, you know, it's very woke, in, industry in general, mm -hmm. about what's happening here. And, and yet it's not very woke as to mm -hmm. what's happening to the Uyghurs, what's happening to the Tibetans, sure. what's happening to the, the Democrats with a small d in Hong Kong. Uh, the, the threats against uh, Taiwan, uh, where you've got indigenous people. I mean, Taiwanese, there are, many of them are indigenous to Taiwan. So, so there seems to be less concern about those folks in Silicon Valley and industry in general than, uh, than, than the concern for, for kind of woke progressive politics here. W what's driving that, and, and how, do they, uh, how do they get their conscience back when it, when it comes to uh, folks around the world, maybe may even victims of environmental disasters. Yeah, in no, the it's, it's Delta. It's I mean, all it's sorts. Of, I mean, there are all sorts of things one could say. You know, it's like if you're concerned about climate change. You know, sure. maybe maybe the tariffs that the Trump administration put on China were way too small. They should be much higher because it's you know it's all you know a carbon tax. Even the electric cars in China are dirty because they use coal power. They're, they're dirtier than than uh, than oil powered cars in China. Um, and so yes, yeah, so I think there, but 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 it somehow is very difficult to uh, to talk about this stuff uh, coherently. You know, I had I had a Set of conversation with some of the Google people on the DeepMind AI technology, where you know, is your AI being used to you know run the concentration camps in uh, in Xinjiang? And well, we don't really know, and don't ask any questions, and um, and you have this almost magical thinking that uh, you know um, by pretending that everything's fine, that's how you engage and have a conversation, and, and you you make the world better, and it's some combination of wishful thinking, it's you know, useful idiots, um, you know, it's. CCP fifth columnist collaborators, <laughs> uh, so it's some superposition of all these things. But yeah, look, I think I think if you think of it ideologically or in terms of you know human rights or something like that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tempted to say it's just profoundly racist. It's like saying that you know because they look different, they're not white people, um, they don't have the same rights. Or it's, 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 there's something super wrong. But uh, but I, I don't quite know how you unlock that. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to Mary Kissel. I think you had a follow up, Mary. Yeah, sorry, just two questions. How do we get around their big data collection advantage, Peter, technically? And two, are there areas where you think we can innovate around them? Thanks. Well, it, I don't think they have a technical advantage. I think it's more of an ideological advantage that in a totalitarian communist society, you have no qualms about getting data on everybody in every way 
in every way possible. And uh, that's what I think makes um, AI, you know, a very tricky technology where even if we're ahead in theory, you know, there are a lot of ways we don't actually want to apply it in, in, in the U.S. or in the West. And, uh, and, um, and they will apply it and get some advantages from it. You know, I, I, think, um, I think the hope is always that uh, it doesn't give you that much of an advantage. You know, does, does big data, how much does big data really tell you about things? Now, you know, there's certain kinds of things it can, it can tell you stuff about, but uh, I don't think it makes as much of a difference as, as, as uh, pe- people want, beyond maybe having, you know, um, sort of all these communist control mechanisms on a, on a society. But, uh, but yeah, there, there's some, some places where, you know, we probably shouldn't even be trying to compete. Uh, let's go to John Burks now. John, you're up. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Uh, Peter, can you talk just a little bit about concretely what we should be doing to improve technology adoption at the Pentagon? Um, so obviously, none of us want to have sort of our technological edge sitting in a, a closet someplace at the Pentagon, but how do we actually move to um, really deploying it? Well, I um, again, I, I'll just repeat what I said earlier, which is that, uh, you know, some... Um, I think, I think, you know, big companies are better at doing things at scale, small companies are better at innovating, and to the extent that we need to innovate, you need to figure out a way for a slightly larger fraction of the pie to go to startup companies, mid-sized companies, new companies with, with technologies, and there has to be a way for it to be an integrated procurement where you can get a pilot, and then there is a pathway for, if the pilot works, for it to, to scale rapidly and get adopted rapidly. And um, and uh, and then the, the sort of opposite version of that that we have now is that uh, you know it's you can only deploy things where you've been buying something from a customer for a decade or something, and you have these sort of chicken and egg type uh, type type rules, which mean that uh, no new person can ever break in, and the, um, the the big defense primes haven't have in many ways gotten to be you know a little bit more sclerotic, less innovative over time, and uh, and it's very hard to correct that. But that's that that would be that would be the one. The thing I would I would zero in on, there obviously are, you know, just all these different areas where, uh, you know, we have we have set programs on like building more aircraft carriers, uh, which, you know, may, maybe we should be doing less of, and we should be doing more more in innovative new areas, and that's always very hard to do because the you know the set programs have a have a constituency around them, and you can't 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 disrupt that easily. So, uh, so you know, when you have a when you have a growing defense budget, you probably have more room for innovation. You know, one one of the worries I have is that uh, you know the defense budget will, will probably not grow that much in the next few years, and uh, and then uh, these innovation challenges are going to be much much harder. And we'll we'll have yeah. you know the, the risk is that we have a repeat of what happened, you know, at the end of the Cold War where the budgets got cut but the innovation got cut a lot more. Christopher Cox. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, Peter, it's great to be on this panel with you. I just want to start off with a point that. Uh, your leadership at Palantir and your policies that you've put in place uh, to say that Palantir won't deal with countries that are uh, uh, aren't on good terms with the United States. That is such a great leadership uh, position you've taken in Silicon Valley, and I really commend you for that because I think that's going to be the big issue. Where does big tech fall in this divide with China and the United States? So I commend you for that. And my question is, uh, regarding digital currency, we've seen Uh, recently in the last few days that China has proposed creating their own digital currency. And I was wondering how much of a threat is that to the dollar uh, to to the dollar and its dominance of uh, world markets? And if it is a threat, what can we do about it? Well, um, you know, I think I think there's sort of a lot of different kinds of things that fall under digital currency. Presumably the one the sort of electronic forms of money China envisions are ones where um, Things can be monitored again, even more uh, granular in an even more granular way uh, than they're being monitored currently. Um, uh, you know, the the geopolitical thing I I sort of wonder about is always that uh, you know the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency of, of the world. You know, there are some things about that that are good for the U.S. Some things that are um, more problematic. Um, from China's point of view, they want to get um, they don't like the U.S. having this reserve currency. Because it gives us, you know, a lot of leverage over, you know, Iranian oil supply chains and all sorts of things like that. Um, they like, uh, they don't want the renminbi to become a reserve currency, because then you have to open your capital account and you have to do all sorts of things that they they really don't want to do. 
um, you know, I think the euro you could think of as, you know, was in part a Chinese weapon against the dollar. It didn't, in the last decade, it hasn't quite worked out that way, but that was, you know, China would have liked to see two reserve currencies like, like the euro. And, uh, you know, even though I'm sort of a pro-crypto, pro-Bitcoin maximalist person, I, I do wonder whether at this point Bitcoin is also, uh, should also be thought in part of, as a Chinese uh, financial weapon against the U.S., where it's, it, is, it threatens fiat money, but it especially threatens the, uh, the U.S. Uh, dollar, and, um, and China wants to do things to weaken it. So it's sort of China is long Bitcoin, and perhaps from a geopolitical perspective, uh, the U.S. should be a little bit, uh, be asking some tougher questions about exactly how that works. But I, I, some, some internal stable coin in China, that, I mean, that's not, that's not a real cryptocurrency. That's just, a, you know, that's just some sort of totalitarian measuring device. <laughs> Venmo for the government. Uh, yes. Mr. Secretary, are you going to comment on that? That, that story made the front page of the <coughs> journal this morning, or Mr. Ambassador, about China wanting to start their own Bitcoin. What do you think about that? So what, if I understand what they're doing is they're digitizing their currency. So separate from Bitcoin, it's still fiat currency, right? That is still mm -hmm. Chinese money that they are now digitizing. It has huge impacts for their surveillance capacity. They would pitch it as anti-fraud. You can prevent fraud from taking place. Uh, I suppose that's true. Uh, this is something I think they believe will reduce the costs of cross-border transactions as well for the Chinese. Your point about not wanting to be a reserve currency I think is right. Uh, I think they'd like it to be among a mix. They want to make sure that when, uh, when Secretary Pompeo issues the sanctions against the Iranian leadership that there is a way to purchase Iranian oil that we don't have the capacity to either seize, understand, or impact. And so I do think these digital currencies, separate from uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, are something you'll see more countries go to. The United States has a project where we're working on it too, but we are we, we will be we will be slow off the gate. It has lots of implications for us here at home. And uh, my guess is that we will not be the leader in this forefront where an authoritarian regime like China sees nearly all upside from having the capacity to issue currency or take away currency from people who act in ways that are inconsistent with uh, Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping thought. No, a a absolutely. You think of one of the things that gives folks freedom is the ability to walk in with a $100 bill or, or, or some type of currency and buy something without it being tracked. But the Chinese will be able to track every single purchase that everyone makes. Now, we've freely given up that, uh, that privacy in many ways with Amazon. So there's a record of everything that we purchase these days, it seems like, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, but but by taking away uh, you know hard currency that can uh, that can be used to purchase things, uh, it, it it will give the Chinese Communist Party an, an enormous measure of control over the the Chinese people. Which and and every every time they have an opportunity for more control, they'll take it. And and as Peter pointed out and the secretary pointed out, uh, uh, this is another big step along with facial recognition to have a a total surveillance yeah, I mean, side. They'll it, know every single single thing that I you, mean on on some level it is it is it is really an extraordinary sociological political experiment with with no real 20th century precedent i mean you know there there are ways that you know probably you know <laughs> stalin was still worse than g and right. probably killed more people but uh but just the degree of hooks that you have into people is is just extraordinary it's sort of like you know it's like sort of it, the government's you know in your innermost core and it's completely out it's like the God of St. Augustine. It's like totally outside you, totally inside you, yeah. knows everything about you. It's, uh, but no, can you not, imagine not how, how this will factor into the social credit score? Omnipotent, yeah. omniscient, yeah. 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 omnimalevolent. Yeah. No, it, it, Makes it, the Stasi it, look like amateurs. No, and the social, <laughs> the social credit score, when you when you tie in the currency uh, to everything yeah, what else, what you're spending money be, on yeah, and everything, yeah. You know, uh, I, quite something I, to hold. I, 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 I've never heard the term omnimalevolent before. <laughs> uh, Dr. Shadlow, Nadia Shadlow, your turn. Hi, it's, it's great to be here, and hi, Peter. It's so nice nice to see you. Um, I wanted to ask one question that goes back to your your original point um, when you were discussing AI and its sort of loose equivalent to communism. How do we address that problem set in our own society of AI, the proliferation of surveillance technologies, and essentially setting up an infrastructure or a foundation, you know, an infrastructure for, um, you know, is nascent, but it's what China has today. And how do we grapple with that? How are you thinking about that today in terms of the U.S. and actually Europe as well? It's a problem there too. Thanks. Well, it's it's all you know. It's it's probably there are all these debates we're having that are you know versions of this. There's sort of the privacy versus transparency. So transparency is more efficient, but um, 
you know, privacy, um, you know, is, is, is an important way in which freedoms are preserved in our, our societies. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think th there are a lot of these ways where, where um, you know, I would, and I would bet on the privacy side, you know, getting a little bit more traction in the years ahead, that, you know, somehow uh, things have been pushed already too far into, you know, the Chinese communist direction in our own country, uh, where, you know, we have um, maybe a few big tech platforms, a few big companies that um, know an uncomfortable amount about, about people. And I think there is going to be some, um, some corrective uh, to, that, uh, to that in the years ahead. And then at the same time, I think in a, in a military context, we, we need to just be uh, pushing, um, pushing this, you know, figuring out ways to build, you know, semi-autonomous or autonomous weapon systems and uh, we need to sort of, you know, figure out ways to combine cyber and AI, and and uh, uh, and, and so there's a military piece where I think we, we need to be going full steam ahead, and then the larger social one, I'd be I'd be more careful. Alex Wong, thanks you, and, and good to be with everyone again. And, and Peter, thanks for uh, for joining our group. It's a real real privilege. You know, earlier uh, you touched on the need to uh, continue reforming the the defense procurement system to to bring uh, applied engineering you know, faster, to, 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 bring, uh, to bring defense systems faster into our competition with China and not, not wait so long. Um, but I'm wondering if, if your thoughts also stray to, to basic R&D and how the US government invests in that. You know, looking at our national labs, looking at the NIH, are they structured in the right way and are they doing enough uh, to invest in, in computing sciences, uh, but also material sciences? Uh, in nuclear, uh, in the biosciences, to provide that that good base for the private sector to continue innovating uh, uh, in applied ways uh, to outrun the Chinese, not just in in the defense systems, uh, but also in, in the wider economy. Yeah, that's a you know my my suspicion is that the uh, yeah the basic science basic research funding is probably you know even more inefficiently and worse allocated than the applied things because when you have something applied you're supposed to get something that works and you get some tests on how how quickly things work you know one of the uh, when I looked into the NIH budgets you know one of the one of the striking things is that uh, a lot of the breakthroughs are made by you know somewhat younger scientists you know the average age of a scientist who gets a Nobel Prize they're sort of in their late 30s early 40s when they make the discoveries um, where they get a Nobel Prize and something like maybe two percent of NIH funding goes to scientists under age forty, and um, and it has, you know, if you look at it over the last thirty years, it has gotten, you know, older and old. The you know the median age of scientists getting the funding has gotten older and older, and it's kind of this institutional inertia lock-in. And uh, and there's probably something about that that you need to always always push back on. There's probably something about um, you know the peer review process uh, in science that leads to a sort of consensus group think but also very incrementalist kinds of things and uh, the kinds of things that worked a lot better in the 50s and 60s were where you had you know one person running DARPA and he knew the you know 30 top scientists in the country and just gave them money and they could work on whatever they, they wanted to and so uh, so I think there are there are ways that um, that as science scales it um, it often uh, becomes less 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 of a science you know big tech, you can think of big tech as um, as, uh, as as something that's very natural. It, it, uh, it's maybe it's it's unnaturally big. It's unhealthy. It's too strong. But um, there's something in the nature of tech to be big. Big science is actually an oxymoron. And uh, it's like if you, if you have if you have a science factory or if you, if you have uh, you know some sort of you know giant uh, science uh, yeah, some giant science factory. There's probably not very much science going on at all. And so so yes, yeah, so I think. Uh, I think I think probably there's a whole bunch of things on the on the basic R and D side where uh, it could it would it, it could be reconfigured in some way that's that's much better and then how you do that politically is again very very hard lift. John Noonan. Hey Peter, nice to see you again. Um, so the great lesson of World War II was that the Industrial Revolution or World War One, excuse me, was that the Industrial Revolution was wedged in the middle of this long century of relative peace between. The Napoleonic Wars and then ultimately the Great Wars. And generals had no idea what those technological leaps and things like steam power, precision machinery, chemical processes that led to dynamite and poisonous gas meant for the battlefield. And the results were pretty awful. So we've had arguably 
three industrial revolutions in the years of relative peace between uh, World War II and today, and I emphasize the word relative. Uh, there was oil, gas, electric, and nuclear fission, telecom, and computers, and then ultimately, I think, where we are now, which is the digital age with fiber optics, satellite communications, cyberspace, et cetera. So I have two very different questions for you, um, and without getting into the viability of photon torpedoes and giant planet-killing space lasers, uh, from your outside perspective as a techno technologist and an investor, what does the 21st century battlefield look like? And then second, just given the fact that Silicon Valley provides the software backbone or central nervous system for almost all of our critical industry sectors, that's IT, banking, agriculture, power, et cetera, how do we reduce our exposure to Chinese and foreign influence in big tech where they could potentially build backdoors into all of these critical sectors that are required for the survival of our country and and ultimately the continuity of government. Thank you. Wow. Well, that's you've done a great job articulating the question, and it's probably that's why, probably why it's very very hard to answer. It's been seventy five years since you know, the end of World War II, seventy six years, and uh, and um, and so I suspect that yeah, if you had a um, a you know a war on a on a, on a global scale. Um, that we have really no model for quite uh, what would happen. I, th I think in World War One, you know, in some in some ways we had a, you know, it was it was prefigured by the Civil War in the U.S. and people just didn't pay attention to that. So there are probably you know things things one could be could be paying attention to, you know, way way things have shifted. And I think the last time aircraft were used where there was an actual battle between um, um, competing um, aircraft uh, uh, military aircraft was. Um, between Israel and Syria in 1982, so I don't think they've actually been we've had combat between aircraft in close to 40 years. Uh, you know, there was just the uh, the drone war in um, Armenia, where Azerbaijan used the drones very effectively. So I, I do think we should be paying very careful attention to um, what what's going on, what's uh, what's uh, what's 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 being used. But it's you know, it's 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 very very weird. You know, if you if you, if you just have sort of basic division, we have you know we have conventional weapons, we have in you know in cyber. We have a shooting war with Russia and China. You know, it's it's, it's all-out war, and then we have you know all these nuclear weapons, which I, I assume never get used, or it's, it's unthinkable. And 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 but so you have like these three completely different um, kinds of weapon system. One, we have a shooting war, you know, the conventional war. Uh, we don't really know what would happen, and then the nuclear war. We we don't even have people thinking about it anymore. You know, it was it was you know it was it was a thing to think about nuclear deterrence strategy in the 50s and 60s. I think the game theory doesn't actually make any sense anymore. It's like the it's like the North Korea problem, where you know it's it's like if you, if you actually think about it rationally, you know we should just be bombing them, or you know you have to stop them now, or every and and, and then maybe you, maybe you um, treat them as a cartoon villain and you ignore it, and that's actually good, but then that doesn't work. No, nothing makes sense, you know. But uh, but so I think yeah, even if you just think about those, those systems and how they would actually interact if you had a major confrontation with China. It's really hard to model out. Mr. Secretary, does anyone sit around and think about that? What the next battlefield looks like? Oh yeah, there's lots of folks working on this. Office of Net Assessment, uh, uh, panicky people down on the bowels of the State Department. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are a big piece of the U.S. government working their way through it. But I think I think Peter's point is well taken. It is so complex, and you don't know how it will unfold. How, 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 for example, just just focus. How, how do people actually think about the nuclear so, nuclear weapons vis-a-vis -vis China? We have a massive advantage in nuclear so, weapons, so they, but if we never use them, it doesn't count. They, they literally have simulations that try and take into account how people rationally often assume rationality. Sometimes they'll try and turn the rationality switch off and say, what happens if someone makes a really bad decision knowingly, uh, knowing that it may impact them, uh, and what their relative value sets mm -hmm. are. But your, your point's very well taken. It, it becomes really complicated really fast. You didn't you didn't mention the other space, which may well get us into those three spaces, which is the information war, mm -hmm. right. which is so confusing and can move so quickly. And the capacity for nations now to act in ways in the information space that that, that mm -hmm. didn't have you were we didn't know what was going on on the battlefields of the Somme, mm -hmm. right? We did for for weeks. Uh, the information battle space is now so central to how this will unfold mm -hmm. that it gets uh, the the variables quickly overwhelm the capacity for modelers to think their way through this. And so they try and do it in bite-sized chunks and make big assumptions and, and we, iterate. We, we, we war game these things. If, 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 I mean, we do these war games, mm -hmm. you know, pretty regularly, and there's a cottage industry, and, and, and some of them are very well run. 
but but the problem with the war games is is what the what Mike just pointed out is you, you introduce so many different variables. It used to be a little easier to do a tabletop, uh, you know, if you were just moving ships or aircraft or that sort of thing around. But once you start introducing cyber, information, space, uh, it, and, and all of a sudden, you know, the homeland becomes at risk, maybe because it's a cyber attack, not not a long-range bomber from, from China, but a cyber attack on an electrical grid. Right. It's always so it's, so it's, 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 it's very, very complicated. So maybe to concretize a little bit, you know, if, if China invades Taiwan, what actually happens? Do we bomb the Straits of Hormuz? Do we cut off the oil? Do we, you know, do we just lose? Do we, is there some, you know, do we use tactical nukes? Yeah, so I think there's reasons presidents don't answer that question for an awfully long time. No, no president's ever said, in the event that this happens, I will, in, in response to A, I will do B. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's strategic ambiguity as right. the concept uh, to try and avoid just exactly that day. Uh, I think a lot depends on uh, two things. One, who is in charge the day that that happens, that leader, and the conditions that that leader has set, and the capacity for that leader to think through the ramifications and to quickly have, have to have prepared himself or herself for that moment, and to understand the attendant risk. And second, uh, can that person at that point in time marshal the world uh, for a response that is broader, that is not just a U.S.-China response, but a response that is more holistic and more complete, has the capacity to at least convince the Chinese that wherever they are along that way, that deterrence can be restored quickly. And in the event that it can't be, uh, you've seen these war games too, it, it escalates rather quickly and it gets very confusing. The information gets very confusing very quickly as well. And we have to keep in mind what, what a strategic uh, coup it would be if the Chinese could take over, not just because of the, uh, Taiwan, not just because of uh, the chips and the factories and the foundries, <clears throat> but Taiwan sits as the cork in the middle of the, mm -hmm. the Pacific. If, if From uh, first island wh whatever country, uh, and it goes beyond that. I mean, the the, the entire Pacific is wide open. Uh, if uh, if China takes Taiwan, I mean, it, it it splits Northern Asia, Japan, our allies there, uh, South Korea. Uh, it splits them from from Australia and, and New Zealand and the Philippines and Thailand are their treaty allies. Uh, but the entire Pacific becomes a, a, a super highway. Uh, all the way out to the Aleutians and Hawaii, and look, we've we've seen this movie once before. And uh, what's your and what's, was, what's your best guess when they're going to take a crack at it, or if, if and when they do it? Look, my my view is that peace or strength works. I mean, we're at the Nixon Library, and peace or strength is more associated with Ronald Reagan and you know the mm -hmm. Simi Valley Library. But but the but the point is, if we have a strong enough to turn, if we continue to invest in 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 the Pentagon and in our forces, if our allies do the same, and that includes the Taiwanese, our, our partners there. Uh, if they, they turn themselves into a porcupine, that would be difficult to digest. Uh, I think it's possible to deter the Chinese from, from doing that. But look, we, I've always said weakness is provocative. Mm -hmm. And if we show weakness to the Chinese or they perceive weakness on our part, it, it, it could actually provoke them into attacking uh, Taiwan. And, and then it leads to all of the, uh, uh, the myriad of problems that the, the Secretary pointed out and, and potentially war. So look, the best way to, to prevent war is to be prepared, uh, be prepared for it. And, and, and that, that, that's the policy we have to pursue. Let me run. Let me John run. Noonan, you had a follow-up? Let, let me run one, one theory by, by you guys here. So I, I always, I, I'm pretty surprised by the crackdown China has done in Hong Kong. You know, I, I always thought they could wait till 2047. They didn't have to do anything quite this drastic. And my, and my mental model was that um, every time the Politburo discussed having a total crackdown in Hong Kong, there was someone in the back of the room who raised their hand and said, we can't do that because we have to convince Taiwan to reunify with China. And uh, this time that person was told, uh, shut up, you know, they're never going to do it peacefully anyway. And, uh, and is, there, is there a way to read the Hong Kong thing as, you know, the Chinese timetable on, on, on uh, Taiwan has moved up? Well, well after Hong Kong, the, you know, the, the idea that the, that the, uh, the Taiwanese would, would gladly or, or without being coerced enter into some sort of you know, one country, two systems. I mean, that that's never going to happen. They saw right. they saw what's happened in Tibet. They've saw what's happened in in Hong Kong now, and they've they've seen what happened in Xinjiang. So, I mean, the idea that the Taiwanese would voluntarily uh, surrender their liberty and their freedom and their democracy to to the Chinese Communist Party is, uh, you know, I think that idea is past, and I think the Chinese have recognized that. And so, the only way for a reunification will be a coerced reunification, in my view, or or, or a total change in China, which. Mm -hmm. I don't think the CCP is contemplating. Remember, too, they have elections there. Right. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party's capacity to influence elections that are held on Taiwan is, is real. 
And so it may not be that it takes carriers mm -hmm. and missiles and bombs and threats. It may mm -hmm. just be that over time you can apply such coercive pressure, military, economic, diplomatic, uh, that you can convince enough people there that it's just not worth the candle. Uh, remember, Taiwan's never been part of China. This, this thing's stitched together. Right? When we think of the historic China, Xinjiang, mm -hmm. Tibet, Mongolia, this, this is stitched together. The, the People's Republic of China itself is a figment of the Communist Party's imagination, and they know it. And they're trying desperately to find the tools they can best to consolidate their own power internally. And one of the tools of that is external power and external threats as well. Uh, John Noonan. Yeah, Peter, just to um, to reiterate my the second part of my question, I think you've warned very um, starkly about companies like Google, who are, I think your words, forgive me if I'm uh, misquoting you, more or less infiltrated uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Silicon Valley provides the, um, the, the backbone and the central nervous system for most of the critical industry se industries and sectors in the United States. And so what's our exposure, just given the fact that uh, Silicon Valley is reportedly infiltrated by a deep and uh, intrusive Chinese communist presence? Yeah, again, I, I, left, I, left, I left it a little bit ambiguous. So I, I, I was unclear on how much is actual, you know, united front Chinese communist agents, how much is useful idiots, how much it's people, you know, surrendered in advance, um, or, you know, there's sort of a lot of Different, different constituencies. Um, you know, I um, look. I think. I think um, we have to. I, I think the the thing I, I would say is we have to just keep putting a certain amount of pressure on on Silicon Valley, and we need to call companies like Google out on um, on on you know working on AI with China, with communist China, and not with the U.S. military. I think. Uh, I think we should be putting a lot of pressure on Apple. Uh, with you know its, its whole uh, labor force supply chain on on the iPhone manufacturing in China, and uh, so I think that's you know that's 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 one way we sort of do a little bit of what you know Robert was talking about earlier, where you sort of you know it's there's obviously some crazy double standard where you know labor laws don't apply there, but they do apply here, and there are all sorts of crazy double standards, and you just need to call people out on that relentlessly. I think the I think the cybersecurity issue is quite a, is is simply a mess as far as I can tell. Where there's basically, you know, the, the basic problem is that uh, cyber is one of these places where offense works a lot better than defense, and uh, and uh, I don't I don't quite know know what what you do. It's uh, I'm, I'm often amazed. You know, I sort of assume that so much stuff has been hacked into in one way or another. I'm I'm sort of amazed the stuff doesn't get used in, in more ways. You know, it's like people should be getting blackmailed, bribed. You know, all sorts of crazy things should be going on all over the place, and somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, you know, all the data that I assume has actually already been exfiltrated. It's 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 actually weird. It doesn't get used more. Uh, I I don't I don't even know why why that is. But my, my model is yeah that it's it's cyber is just a disaster and it's actually amazing that um, it doesn't manifest itself more. Christian Whiten. Thank you, Hugh. Um, Peter, speaking of getting sort of tougher on Silicon Valley or holding them to account. Um, you know, the Supreme Court recently decided to vacate its order that former President Trump, or while he was president, couldn't block people on Twitter. But the more interesting development was a concurring opinion from Clarence Thomas, the Associate Justice, who basically said that companies like Twitter uh, and others uh, should be regulated or could be regulated as common carriers, basically implying that they're sort of a natural monopoly and that their um, attempts to censor people, which I think we know sort of tend to focus much more on conservatives could in fact be limited, could be regulated by the federal government or by state governments in the same way we regulate utilities. Do you think that is sort of the future of, of where we're going with uh, with Twitter and other platforms like it? Well, it's, um, uh, look, I'm on, I'm on the Facebook board, so I have to always be careful what I, what I, what I say here, but, uh, but uh, you know, it, the uh, deep, deep platforming President Trump, um, you know, two months ago, three months ago, was really, was really quite, quite extraordinary, and uh, and um, that you know, I, th I think there has been a lot of deplatforming of conservatives, and I, I always think that the actual censorship that people talk about is just the tip of the iceberg, and the real problem is the downranking. So, uh, so you know, um, you know, one of the top Google executives used to always say five, six years ago, oh, we never censor anybody, we just downrank people. And the downranking was actually the far more 
in, insidious way to sort of tilt the uh, the playing field of the, of the discourse. Um, but uh, you know, then there's been outright censorship, outright deplatforming, and when you do it with a with you know the president of the United States, that that does feel like uh, you really uh, crossed some kind of Rubicon where you know, and I'm not I'm not sure you declare war, war on half the country, but maybe a third, forty percent of the country. That and that seems that seems really really crazy. You know, when when you have Angela Merkel and Obrador from Mexico saying that the tech platforms have been too anti-Trump, too mean to Mr. Trump. Um, that tells you you've probably really overreached. Matt Pottinger, you had a comment? Yeah, you know, just thanks a lot, Hugh. One, one thing, uh, going back to the conversation about Taiwan, that we should remember is that we're talking about all the different domains that China fights in, information, cyber, uh, 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 as well as military and, and, and the rest. One of the strongest uh, uh, tools we have is our dominance in finance, uh, capital markets and, and the, the reserve currency status of the dollar that we talked about. When it comes to Taiwan, one thing that we should be reminding China uh, about is that if they were to try to coerce, coercively annex Taiwan, uh, we could shut down their entire banking system. So in other words, we can bring, uh, uh, we could sanction all their major banks. We can bring a lot to that fight as, as a way to deter them that is non, non-military, uh, but could actually carry even more profound costs uh, for China's economy. So I just wanted to add that, that idea. Oh, thank you. Morgan Ortega. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Great to be with you. Um, one of the things that struck me in your book that I really liked is you talked about at the very beginning how if when you're innovating, if you are or starting a new company, if you're trying to make the next Facebook or the next Google that you're already behind, that you're not doing anything innovative. And I was wondering, um, this is a really big grand question, but I was wondering if there's a way to apply this to foreign policy to what we do. Uh, I know the secretary could probably concur that foreign policy and what we do at the State Department hasn't changed in probably 100 years. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of innov innovation. So is, is there a way to apply what you've done uh, in, in the business world and innovating, innovating and being entrepreneurial to how we look at foreign policy going forward, especially hoping that some of us will be working again in four or eight years. Well, I think that's a better question for Robert or, or Mike. My, I guess my, my sort of um, pro-innovation bias is always that uh, people are somehow too anchored on the past. And uh, in business, they're too anchored on uh, doing things that worked in the past or copying some model that, you know, you know, building a new search engine was the right thing to do for Google in 1999. It's probably not the right thing to do today because very hard to compete against Google by doing the exact same thing they're doing. They, they, you know, and and uh, and then I think the you know, I think the foreign policy um, mistake that I suspect gets made you know a great deal and over and over again is to somehow think that we're still at some point in the past. And so you know so so maybe maybe the maybe one version of the mistake that was made with China was to think that it was going to be like the Soviet Union and then. You know, the Berlin Wall came down in 89, and then surely, you know, something like that was going to happen in China. We're sort of anchored on the 1980s and used that as a, as, as, as a frame. And then, of course, uh, of course, the dynamic thing where, you know, China can also look at the history and read the history and say, well, that's exactly what's not going to happen. And we're not, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have um, uh, perestroika, but no glasnost. <laughs> and we can sort of also innovate in certain ways and, uh, and, uh, and avoid that. And, and then I, you know, I, there's or there's you know there's sort of a, a version where you know it's like well you know is this like 1914 or is this you know you know is this 1989 or you know what year is this? And I, I always say you know it's, it's actually just 2021, and that's a, not very helpful. But maybe that's where we should start. Uh, Monica Crowley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, Ambassador. So good to see you. And Peter, thank you so much for doing this today. How do you see companies and platforms like TikTok, Chinese-owned, um, globally hugely popular, and yet a national security threat to the United States? Obviously, the discussions surrounding TikTok's future are ongoing, and, and we don't have a determination yet about that. But 
How do you see this going forward? Should the United States have an overarching uniform policy to deal with platforms and, and companies like this, or should we be dealing with them on an ad hoc basis? Thank you. Well, obviously, um, a uniform policy is always better, but I often worry that that's um, slow. You know, it's like I think multilateralism is always better than unilateralism um, in theory, and then in practice, multilateralism is often an excuse um, that you have if you want to not do anything. And we, you know, if you say we need to do it multilaterally, maybe uh, that's one way of saying we need to do it for real, and maybe it's a way of saying we don't need to do it at all. And so, um, so yeah, I think I think uh, I, I would like to just see sort of fast, flexible response. You try to, you know, you try to do whatever you need to do to stop the house from burning down, and then, and then you try to formalize it as as fast as possible. You know, I think the thing um, that's problematic about TikTok is that uh, it again has this sort of incredible exfiltration of data about people. It's, you're sort of creating this incredibly uh, privacy invading map of you know, you know, um, a large part of you know the population of the, of the Western world. Um, and um, and then I think it's also it's it's again one of these sort of odd things where it's you know a fairly powerful application of AI in a certain sense where it's it's you know it's uh, it's innovative and they figured out ways to make it especially addictive and they figure out you know what videos to show you so that if you watch these you'll just keep watching more and more, um, but it's it doesn't seem like the sort of thing that it, you know if you shut it down it would be you know this economic catastrophe either you know I think I think India banned TikTok and there were sort of less good alternatives that that popped up that were that were local and and I, I don't think it was like a tremendous tremendous loss and so so it's uh so I think how to talk about it is often quite tricky and we need to figure, figure out a way where we can say that it's both this um, problematic AI technology on one level and then on another level it's not that valuable a technology at all uh, and and for which reason we, we can probably do without it you let me just pitch in here. When we were thinking about TikTok, two things uh, that you, you reminded me of. One, our tools weren't very good to respond to it, right? Our tools are the historic tools that we've had for all these years of how do you stop someone if they're bringing in contraband on a, on a ship that's coming across the sea, right? These export models, how do you, how do you do? They're, not, they're really not made fit for purpose for this world. And so we struggled. So we worked around them, worked through it, got as creative as we could to figure out the, the toolkit that would best address that problem set as quickly as we could. Uh, the commercial response was much greater than the uh, public response. Uh, your point, the Indian foreign minister told me when they banned, I can't remember the ultimate number, but dozens. I think it was 100, the, 150 ultimately. The, the first group that they did, it was a matter of weeks before there were, call them knockoffs if you will, but mm -hmm. an Indian made, Indian manufactured proxies for the mm -hmm. applications of the software that had been gone. It may not have been at the same level, it may not have been as perfect, mm -hmm. but the people of India were uh, reasonably satisfied. And so I think policymakers are often very concerned that if they take something away that there'll be this huge political backlash from something that's as popular as Tic Tac. My sense is that uh, innovators and capitalists will figure a solution to, to at least meet the demand if that demand is in fact real. Yes. Okay, we've got three more before we run out of time. Lonnie Chan. Thanks, Hugh, and uh, thanks for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, curious to get your thoughts on something that I think China has done relatively well, actually, over the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, and that's infiltrate international organizations. Uh, I think they've done a tremendous job, for example, of seizing leadership of the World Health Organization, and we've seen how that rot has spread and in fact gotten in the way of us discovering uh, the origins of COVID-19 uh, along with other potential problems. Uh, other organizations, I think they've been successful at infiltrating as well. Uh, finally, during the last couple of years under the leadership of many of the people on this, uh, on this seminar, we've started to push back on China and, and started to say, look, you know, you can't do this and can't have the playing field to yourself anymore. But is that really the right long-term solution here? You know, are these sort of international organizations, this model of international collective action, uh, is it the right one to deal in areas like intellectual property, for example, uh, healthcare, or do we need to go to something fundamentally different to Peter's point about innovating? Is this an area where we need to be more innovative to think outside the box? And if so, what's the right answer? Why you take it? You know, one, one short uh, comment on that, Lonnie, and it's uh, a great question. It's something that, that we worked on very hard, uh, Mike's team and, and our team at the NSC, was to, to, number one, try and make sure that there were uh, candidates that believed in, in 
and free, free you know, men and women and free markets, uh, at least competing for these international organization top slots. But it's not just a top slot, it's, it's the deputy, it's, it's the functionaries, uh, even to the point the interns, the Chinese were, were funding massive number of Chinese interns at international organizations that were cash strapped and those interns would learn and, and would have the, the first crack at jobs. So, uh, you know, we need to compete there. We need to com compete effectively. There are quota systems at the UN. Uh, we weren't even filling the quota for Americans at the UN. And there, there are plenty of young you know, men and women in this country that are, that are constantly asking me, the Secretary Peter, I'm sure, uh, how do I get in government? I want to do foreign policy. I want to do foreign affairs. One of the ways to do it, it's how I got started, was an international organization. And so uh, we need to make sure Americans are in those, those places. But going to your, your second question of, of, you know, can they ever be effective? And they're, they're, they're generally not, you know, uh, super effective. I and mean, we can pick out examples, Gulf One, uh, and a few other examples, but there are very few where, where international organizations have mobilized to effectively uh, protect us. We need to have groupings of like-minded countries, and so one of the things that, that we worked on and that, that Mike worked on very hard was the Quad, where we brought Japan, uh, India, Australia together with the United States to address common issues in the Indo-Pacific. So I think pulling together multilateral co lateral coalitions of like-minded uh, countries that may not necessarily be institutionalized, but at least uh, are, are there on an ad hoc basis, is a way for us to harness the uh, the value of, of working with our allies and friends and partners uh, to address specific threats uh, and, and not necessarily getting caught up in the quagmire of, of the UN or other UN specialized agencies. So I think it's two parts. One, we need to compete and play there. Uh, but two, we also need to put together our own uh, groups of, of like-minded countries to address some of these global issues. Yeah, Mike, do you have any thoughts, sir? No, uh, yeah, there's a couple more questions. Go ahead. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of these are, are designed not to work at this point, and uh, and you know they, they it's amazing people still think that they they work at all. You know, there's sort of I think that the New Dealers had this fantasy after you know 1945 that you could create these these organizations and they'd be sort of American, not quite controlled, sure. but heavily influenced. And uh, you know the way I understand the history is I think already by the time of the Marshall the Marshall Plan was already a workaround. Yeah. And it was basically sure. it was it, it didn't actually go through any of the the multinational post World War II organizations because they were already deemed ineffective by the time of the Marshall Plan. We should never accept Chinese I, participation as their desire to make these things functional. Right, <laughs> right. it is an instrumentality for them. It is a, they're not a rights respecting nation, and uh, they don't join these organizations to make them better and, and effective. I'm going to go to Kimberly Reed, then uh, Mary Kissel, then Chris Cox to wrap it up. Kimberly. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much. I just uh, finished uh, tenure as uh, the first woman chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. And um, I really want to thank you for all you're doing in Silicon Valley, but also for sending some great uh, uh, colleagues of yours into USG. Um, enjoyed working with them. Um, Congress, including uh, Congressman uh, Gallagher and uh, Congressman uh, Waltz, who are on the China Task Force, um, was they were really instrumental in recognizing that uh, financing was key in competition with China. And uh, Congress changed the law last year to allow XM to match the rate terms and conditions that uh, the PRC would be offering uh, foreign purchasers around the world for uh, products that we all care about, including uh, uh, transformational exports. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, you wrote your great book in 2014, and uh, you've been uh, involved uh, uh, with what's happening in our government as we are hearing today. Um, any thoughts on what else uh, government should be doing with um, Silicon Valley uh, when it comes to competition with China? Well, we, you know, I, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a it's a it's a multi, it's a multifaceted thing. I, I don't think, you know, I don't I don't think we should be super dogmatic. So you know, I'm I'm probably always you know sort of very free market libertarian, and the dogmatic libertarian thing would be that you shouldn't have an export import bank because it's it, it involves all these government subsidies of loans. But um, if in a world where we don't really have free trade and we don't have an, a balanced uh, playing field, um, it. It, it it makes a lot of sense to have something like the Exim Bank and to and to actually expand it, and so uh, so I think uh, yes yeah, so I think there's sort of I think we should be trying a lot of different things a lot of different areas and uh, we should try to be practical not not dogmatic on it. So uh, let me go over to Mary Kissel again, Mary. Hey, thanks, uh, Peter. Um, I've just taken some notes here. So they're in a tech war with us. We're not with them. They've infiltrated our campuses our labs and our international organizations, they have a big data collection advantage. 
They'll use unethical means to win. Our defense department is a mess. We're riven by a privacy debate and they're ahead in crypto threatening our reserve currency status. Are you optimistic here? I mean, where, how do you feel after, you know, coming to a list like that? Look, I think I think there are a lot of look, I think I think uh, something about the format of this sort of conversation always pushes you to be a little bit more negative and stress all the all the problems that, that there are. You know, I, I would say, you know, I would say on, on the, yeah, I think, I think if it was, if, it, if it's a, if it was a fight between the U.S. and China, um, I think that's, that's, that's a tough one for, for the U.S., but I, I don't think that's going to be the dynamic. I think it's going to be China against the whole world. And, um, you know, it is, um, you know, one metaphor I've heard for China is that it's, it's kind of a, it's a weirdly autistic country where, you know, it's, everything is sort of, Drawn to, to the center, um, and uh, and you know may, I mean maybe maybe they can strong arm Taiwan, but I I think you know it's 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 it's, it's just it's it's profoundly uncharismatic, and uh, and I think uh, I think that that's you know that's 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 a that's a that's a very big limitation they have, and and uh, and then even even if it looks like you know they're winning, they're they're the rising power, um, I think that will have the effect of. You know, scaring a lot of other countries. You know, it's it's like, uh, you know, the U.S. has challenges, but uh, you know, we like countries like Vietnam or or India or Japan, you know, or Taiwan. They're not threatened by the U.S. at this point, and they're they're going to be much more naturally on on the U.S. side and on the anti-China side. There, and so there's there's something about uh, the China the China dynamic that's been extremely, you know zero sum in a way that I would, I would say is sort of borderline autistic. And uh, Peter, uh, I'm going to interject a question before I go to Christopher to wrap it up. Since it's China versus the world, should the world be going to China in 2022 for the Olympics? The State Department this evening announced that they were backing away from their uh, earlier story today about having a boycott. And I'd love to hear what the ambassador and the secretary think about that, too. Should the world descend on Beijing? Well, I, I think, um, my, I mean, it's dangerous to make predictions, but my, my prediction is that it will not. I mean, maybe maybe our athletes will go. I don't think you're going to have many political leaders from the Western world, and it will, you know, like maybe it's not a full boycott like the 1980 um, Olympics in Moscow, but I think it will. Um, it'll be anticlimactic. It'll be. You know the turnout, the validation for China will be, you know, it will be as bad as Sochi in 2014. That's even with no uh, boycott. Talk about this next month, but Mr. Secretary, you want to give us a preview of what you're going to say? <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't think we should go. I don't think we should have any American go participate in the genocide Olympics. <laughs> Just make how you would send your child there to compete when, if they said so much as, a oh, boy, the food's bad here today, you could end up in a Chinese prison for an awfully long time. That's a, a modest overstatement. It seems like an awful lot of risk. I think she knows that. Uh, he might well not take anybody and hold them, uh, but it's not a risk that I would suggest one of my family members, if they were good enough athletes, uh, ought to take. I, I, hope, I hope we'll convince the IOC not to hold them there and find another solution. We figured out how to move an all-star game pretty quickly. Maybe we can figure out how to move an Olympics. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, you want to add anything? Well, they, they, they've revoked, uh, for, for Mike and, uh, and Pottinger and myself, they've revoked our invitation. So I don't think we'll be going under any circumstances. And, uh, and I agree. It's, it, it, is, uh, it goes back to this double standard that we spoke about earlier. It's amazing how quickly uh, uh, corporate America can, uh, can justify a move from Atlanta to Denver, uh, but uh, is perfectly prepared to, uh, to continue to support uh, events in China. So it's... Uh, it's an area of real concern, and, and as the former hostage envoy, and having dealt with some cases in uh, uh, in China with with the secretary's full support, uh, uh, he and I have probably seen this uh, movie play out uh, more times than we'd like, and, uh, and and it is somewhat frightening. And and the Chinese seem to be getting into the hostage game, uh, or at least the detainee game, with the two Michaels, the uh, uh, Spaver and and Kovrig, uh, the the Canadians, uh, the way the Iranians have played the game for many years. So it, it's. I think anyone's got to be very concerned uh, and has to think twice about what you, you know, why you're going to China, what you're going to do there, and uh, if you want to take the risk of having, having an extended stay as a guest of uh, of Mr. Uh, of Xi Jinping. Christopher Cox, last comment or question to you? 
Sure, thanks you and thank you everyone for this wonderful night. Uh, my question really is uh, to everyone on the panel. Uh, during the Cold War, we had uh, benchmarks of how we were doing against the Russians, against the Soviets. And we also had a very clear ending. Uh, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, it was clear we'd won. Uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, it was clear that we'd won. In an AI arms race with China, are there similar benchmarks uh, that will show how we are doing in the years to come? And at the end of the day, what will determine whether we've won or lost? Well, I, I think AI is a very difficult one to benchmark, but uh, I, th I think, um, you know, I, th I think one of the big flashpoints the last few years has been the Huawei 5G piece, and that's that's been, you know, fairly straightforward. You know, you know, you just go down the list of countries, what are they doing, and um, you, you can you can sort of see how we're how we're doing, how successful we are at holding the line there. You know, I think um, I think there's going to be sort of some question about the semiconductor, the, se the semiconductor boycotts, how effective those are, and. Uh, you know, will China be able to ramp up its production? Get around that. Um, so I think that can be that that one will be benchmark. You know, pretty straight, pretty straightforwardly as well. You know, AI is AI is always this this crazy buzzword. It means all these different things. And so um, I, maybe 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 that's even a, a term one has to be careful to use for that reason. Go ahead, Bert. Yeah, I, I think just uh, <coughs> two things. Uh, one is how many Confucius Institutes continue to uh, be allowed to participate, and some of these Chinese student organizations that are that are controlled by the uh, the CCP and 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 keep other students, other students of Chinese descent, from uh, participating in, in, in U.S. universities with free speech. Uh, so we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, the, their influence operations, but starting with those because those are those are something easy to benchmark if the. The institutes are closed and removed from campus. That's something that uh, uh, that, that, that I think we'll, we'll see as useful. And I think the other thing, the other big fight, and this is something that uh, Larry Kudlow and I uh, start, uh, ran from the White House, and that's preventing uh, U.S. investment in, in China. I mean, we're li we've literally had U.S. Uh, investment dollars <coughs> going to Chinese companies that are building ships and aircrafts and munitions and, and tanks. That could ultimately be, ultimately be used against uh, either ourselves or allies or partners in the region. So, I think if we can cut off the flow of investment and uh, and limit the the overt influences, I'm not talking about you know the covert influence, but just the overt influence. I think those are two benchmarks that uh, that the Biden administration has a chance to to gain some traction on and, and show that we're going to stand up to the Chinese. And, and let me say one other thing. I, I think Secretary Pompeo, Mike hasn't gotten the. Uh, the recognition that he deserves for, for a number of the measures that he took in his last week in office, uh, but especially in uh, uh, labeling what was happening to the Uyghurs, what is happening to the Uyghurs as, as genocide. It, it took a lot of courage. Uh, he was the person with the statutory authority to, to make that decision. Uh, there were a lot of people that were angry about it, both overseas and uh, and in this country, especially on, on Wall Street. On the fourth floor at the State uh, Department. At the State <laughs> Department. It took a lot of courage. and uh, but. But history is going to treat uh, Mike very well for for having made that uh, uh, decision, just just like it's it's treated folks well who made the, uh, the similar calls in the 30s and 40s, but were not popular at the time. So uh, I just want to uh, make make that comment before I turn the mic over. Well, that's to you. that's very nice, Robert. You know, it's an important question. I don't know that there's a singular answer. Uh, in the end, uh, Xi Jinping is afraid of liberty and sovereignty and the rules-based order. It's his enemy. And we will, we will know uh, who ultimately wins this by what, which ideas dominate the next 10, 20, 40 years. Are they a set of Western ideas? Are they a set of understandings that flow from the authoritarian regime in China? There is a global component to this. We, I, I will take credit for what President Trump allowed us, those of us on this call who served his administration, to do. We had a chance for the first time to go around the world and make the case for why the threat from uh, that central underpinning, that central idea that the Chinese Communist Party, this party, right, not a country, a party puts forward in an attempt to dominate the world. And so ultimately this will be fought out as an ideological struggle as much as anything else. And we need to remind ourselves of our founding and our history and the power that flows from that. We need to be uh, unashamed about talking about that, whether we're on a college campus or at a PTA meeting or at the United Nations. In every one of those four, we need to put forward the central thesis that that our, our liberty and our ideas about freedom and, you know, Peter's talking about being a libertarian, that's my background as well, right? The capacity for individual human beings to engage in rational activity in the way that they prefer to do so. Uh, that's how we'll know if we've ultimately won or not. 
I want to thank our special guest, Peter Thiel, and our co-chairman, Ambassador O'Brien, Secretary Pompeo, and the 15 members of the seminar. Thank you. Next month, we will go back to the Olympics, as we had promised to do this month, but we had Peter Thiel with us, so we took the opportunity to do that. Thank you all. Good night. We'll talk to you in May.